Hey, it's Camo from Nashville Access, and we're here at the world famous Pie Wagon again, just off Music Row, with my special guest James House. As, as the camera hey. dollies in. Hey. How's it going? It's going good, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We were watching some movie last night, and uh, well, all the actors were doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I know they can't all talk like that now. I think it was, I forget what, but every, every, every male actor was like, hey, we gotta get out of this situation. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, what have you been up to? You've been kind of busy. Well, you know, I'm a, a songwriter, so yeah. it kind of helps the, the motion all the time. Um, I got back from the UK, and then it's kind of hit my status, you know, just you know, we were talking about it. Calls your name, yeah. come write a song, come write a song. So, you know, lucky I got to, I co-wrote six on, on the new Joe Bonamassa record, which yeah. is really fun, and that's, that's out and doing well. That's a killer record. Thank you, yeah. I, try, I listen so to I them and I try and figure out which of the ones you wrote. Right. The good ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then I'm going to go to yeah, Greece, Greece in January with Joe and, and the band, and we're going to write. There's a studio over there, and all live at the studio, and we'll write and record for a month. So. That's tough. That, that's <laughs> rock stars. <laughs> um, and, that, and there's another girl that, uh, there's another artist, uh, Kevin Shirley, who produced yep. Joe's album. Um, the producer, uh, her name is uh, uh, Joni Taylor Shaw, mm -hmm. and she's blues rock, and she's been actually opening up for Joe. So, uh, you know, I got in on that one six months with her. So that's been a lot of fun. And, and then I'm working on a, uh, a new project of my own. Cool. There's always something going. Yeah, so, I mean, you and Joe in the UK, that's that's kind of become like this strange triangle. <laughs> Joe really took off in the UK oh, yes. before yeah. here. Yeah. And you had a lot of success in the UK as well. Well, they just, their music fans. Yeah. I don't know. But, um, I saw, I went to what Joe show last time I was over there, Van yeah. Emerson. Yeah. Cool. Just, really a cool. great venue. <laughs> Beatles played, Zeppelin, you name it, played there. I saw Skinner there. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's our deco. Great room. Um, and I, you know, they played about four or five of my songs in the set. I'm by by myself. Yeah. I was on the road over there. So I want to like, you know, elbow the guy next to me. He's like, you know, my wife shares with me. We got to go, yeah, that's cool. You do. <coughs> I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> How good was that? Yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. It was great. It was uh, thrilled to be here. You've written with some, or written for, had hits with a lot of big names over the years. Um, I've been real lucky. In fact, I, I just, we, we were over at the record store been collecting vinyl yeah. back and yeah. getting all the vinyl back that I uh, gave yeah, away or right. lost, you know. <laughs> Don't need that anymore. Anyway, um, it was a Rita Coolidge song yeah. that I, I read for Rita back in 84 or 5 called uh, Never Let You Go. Yeah. And so, you know, her vinyl was there and it was great. So, um, yeah, you know, yeah, I was back with her. I had a Kyla Coke, yeah. um, you know, Martina McBride, yeah, Troy Yoakum, Mavericks, and that stuff. So, yeah, I've been very. Very, very lucky. I just, you know, it's a, it is an honor to be able to do what I do. And, and more recently, more than anything, songwriting, I'm doing something called Songwriting with Soldiers, which is just an incredible thing. We go out and we go to these retreats, and they invite uh, vets in, and sometimes vets and their families, and you write songs with them, and it's a life-changing experience for Not everybody. Really. How is it a life-changing experience for you as a songwriter? Because you're doing what you do. This is a new world for them, right. in most cases. Right. How is it? How well, you know, it? most of the time you're dealing with your own neuroses. Yeah. It's all right. yeah. It's like dredging up your whatever. Right? Songs. It's, in this sense, they tell you what's going on. You start talking with them in a conversation. And everybody has a song. Everybody. And these vets, you know, they, they, this stuff just starts pouring out. And, and, and you just kind of look for that hook of what's going on in their lives. Um, I wrote recently, I was one of the, uh, give me an example, uh, one of the retreats and one of the events I was working with. He spends his days wandering the woods. He comes home and he, that's what he does all day. All day. And so we wrote a song called Out of the Woods. You know, so that's what, so you just kind of uh, find what, yeah, hopefully some hook that's going on with them. And the last retreat, uh, we had a bunch of great musicians. So one of the veterans, he was a Vietnam veteran, Mary. <laughs> He stole the show. <laughs> you know? He did a duet and he had this great blues voice, you know. So there's all that hidden talent there, you know, for some reason people get directed to different directions. Does it kind of put your 
the issues that you have to deal with? Does it kind of put it in perspective? Well, I mean, I think it's just made me a better songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you, you just you have to be empathetic for these men and women. It's yeah, the sacrifices they make, especially in this, you know, all of the wars, of course, but a lot of this, you know, the, the four or five tours, they come back and tra get traumatized. And uh, trying to find answers and trying to get back into the civilian life. And the, uh, the uh, coming back home is just difficult. So we, we just do our best to help them you know, explain their story. And it seems to, you know, be cathartic. I know it is for me. We're going to be talking uh, in a couple of weeks to Stephen Cochran, who's a songwriter here in Memphis, but he's also a vet. And he's put together a project called Stop 22, and it's going to help build awareness for the 22 vets that are coming home and killing themselves. Every day. Yeah, every day. Yeah. So it's, we hear that story up there a lot. In fact, I'm doing one tomorrow. I'm flying up to uh, Grand Rapids. I'm writing with six vets tomorrow. I'm going to get part of this program and bring a songwriter. And so that, and, and I think it's just as, you know, oddly enough, is an art form. It's a real interesting thing to take somebody, come at you with their story, and write it right back to them. And they, they get a piece of the song. They actually end up being a songwriter. So. Oh, that's cool. I know. Sorry, it's Darden Smith's. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, because on your latest album, right. you would put a cut that you wrote with Darden for that. Yeah, I want Darden's. I don't know if we wrote it for that. We did, uh, it was about that or, or something about Or proceeds went to it. It did go to yeah. right. Um, but Darden, it's, it's his baby, and it's just uh, uh, like every, a lot of people have done it. I just did it with Gary uh, Nicholson. And then, you know, that was a chap. So it's a really great song that was going. We all end up on that. It's just hard to explain the experience until you're in the middle of it and you spend three days. How has how things changed for you as a songwriter from when you started out to now? I mean, the world is cheap of, of publishing and everything else is changed hugely. How has it changed for you? Well, the business changed. I mean, as a songwriter, my life's changed. So now I still like songs. So I, I, I've been doing it since the do you worry a lot about the business side of that? You know, yes and no. I mean, this new law was, yeah. you know, it, it all happened. If you want to get into it a little bit, it actually yeah, started in 96. Yeah. When the FCC changed the law from allowing uh, a company to only have two radio stations in a market, right. and then they opened it wide up so they could own yeah. as many as they want. Before then, there's 2,500 country radio stations. Yeah. Probably owned by about 2,000 owners. Yeah. So you got a really diverse, great. Same with pop. So you got a lot of voices. You can break something regionally, and see if it took off long enough. Like we heard, remember Bob Seger taking yeah. off and stuff, and, and it took off in the Midwest. I remember reading about it in Time Magazine. Yeah, this guy's exploding. So that was region. That went away in '96, yeah. and they so you got to Clear Channel and all these things. So it's make, it's make you know music now, yeah. and and it, I hold nothing against the artists or the writers that are going for it because they have they're trying to write what's going on, and you're only you know you have to. Uh, give them what uh, that medium wants. And at this point, it's just, it's really five people making all the decisions, yeah. probably. So you do all the songs, of, with your exception, yeah. you know, sound a lot the same. Yeah. Of course, you know, it, it's always had its trends. Yeah. You know, as soon as the Beatles said, everybody wanted to be a Beatle. Elvis we laughed at CRS because when the country radio seminar is in town, it, originally the intent was the artists were to mingle with the jocks on the radio stations and build a relationship and get the airplane. Now, like you said, it's about five guys. So just do away with CRS. Have those five guys come in, have a meeting, say, here's a new artist you're going to pay. That's it. <laughs> and go home. All right. Save a lot of traffic headaches. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we used to have some, so much fun with CRS. Yeah. You could build these relationships. Still one of my dear friends, Judy Austin, out of mm -hmm. Medford, Oregon. Uh, she was the MD at the big station there. And they were they were the reporter. So I, I got to know her a bit. Kip Talgan said she was really like your brother. So she called her friend up in Eugene, up in, you know, just up the road in Eugene, yeah. Oregon. And then from there, we went to Seattle and all the work big. So I had this regional head start just for one person. This is right. Uh, so that's, that's, that doesn't happen these days. Yeah. And uh, that's a shame because we're getting shortchanged musically. Yeah, and, and, you know, we, we get into the discussion about how radio you know, all sounds the same because guys are getting hits with songwriters that, you know, like Dallas Davidson is getting hits because he can. And people keep going to Dallas for music because he's getting the hits. You can't fault, fault Dallas. No, 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 no. You can't fault the artists because they're saying, we're going to get it again on radio. Uh, so it's a, it's a tough thing to say, who, who changes this? 
the audience always shaking. Yeah. Then let the, you know, just let it. It's gonna change. Well, it already is. People just go back to vinyl. Yeah. 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 I mean, radio, terrestrial radio stuff is gonna yeah. tougher because of that. So, and a lot of traditional artists are starting to break through now. Uh, like uh, me and William Michael Moore, and they're starting to break. Mary Morris took off and yeah. 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 stable with great yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I, it's kind of like it'll take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Now. You had a bit of a resurgence because, of, as an artist, you had a big, big, big hit. Yeah, I was number five. I guess that's pretty good. And then it, it, you know, went to gold, and that's cool. But then, in the past couple of years, all of a sudden, you're number one on the dance charts in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it wasn't a remix. Yeah. You know, it's country dance, yeah. so they sure. line dance over. Oh yeah, over there. You got line dance so, everything. Everything. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I found out. Everything. So nothing special. <laughs> Um, but one of the, it's driven by the choreographers a lot. Yeah, over there, they'll come up and they'll find a song they like, create a dance to it. You know, you know people actually read the dances. And go out on the floor. There, are, there are magazines for line dancing right. in the UK and Europe. Yeah, yeah and a couple of them are really sleazy. <laughs> we won't mention <coughs> it. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's a, they're great, the audience is great. So that kind of gave you a resurgence as a solo artist again, and you put out a new record. Yeah, and I took them back over, and now we're just kind of, the first tour was about just kind of going to see what this was all about. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> Gotta go see this. <laughs> so we went and did it. Um, and now I've got a band out of Liverpool. Yeah. So I'm going back over for three shows. And somebody else is kind of trying to build the audience. And, and if it's fun, I don't want to do it if it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's travel. Yeah. I mean, it's away from family and all that stuff. But, uh, like I said, the band's great, so I got a good little uh, team over there. That's so, which do you like better, being a solo artist or more concentrating on the songwriting? Yes. <laughs> All of it. All of it. All of it. Which is hard. The performing is hard. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's travel. You can ask any road musician, it's, you gotta get up. But these days with songs we do, I mean, you know, so we've been filled with streaming, basically. Don't stream. No, uh, buy your music. Buy your music. Uh, it, it just kills songwriters. Right. You know, it, and I just wrote, it, what was the guy that wrote all about the bass? Co wrote it. Yeah. 100 and what? I don't know, oh, 78 yeah. million yeah. streams. And they made five, five grand. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're not going to get music right now. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, yeah, it was some great experience. But I, to go over there and have that kind of response was really, really hard. Uh, I love the people. The country music has really taken off worldwide. Yeah. And I mean, I do a weekly thing on one of our affiliate stations in, in Tamworth, which is the country music capital of Australia. And I said, oh, I'm going to be talking to James Houston. And he got really excited. Did they? Yeah, that's cool. Uh -huh. So that's that's the one station that goes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a station in Uruguay for some reason. Yep. Likes my music. I, don't, I have no idea why. Get these little checks for oh, have 20 airplanes in the Uruguay this month. Okay. So there's your six pesos. There it is. <laughs> well, I'm not going to see those folks. But, um, yeah, you know, country music's a little bit. Um, there's just been this resurgence of 90s country, which is what I did. Yeah. And it was a fun time of country music, it really was. Looking, I mean, when we were in the middle of it, they were saying my stuff was pretty progressive. Yeah. But the difference like now it's like so traditional. <laughs> but the difference was radio then. You you had a mix of more pop sounding stuff and the traditional yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, that's why I moved to Nashville. Yeah. And then now it's just like this is the sound of one. It's all one thing. It is. That's why I moved to Nashville because you had guys like Steve Earle, Randy Travis, yeah. Dwight Yoakam, all getting on radio too. All had a great success. And they were all different voices. Yeah. You know, from George Strait to Steve Earle. Yeah. You know, that's just it's Texas, but. Well, oh, remember when Russell's heart hit, and it's like, these are the Eagles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was a yeah. really exciting time to get here in 88, and music was exploding. I had some friends, Wendy Wallman and Josh Leo, who came out mm -hmm. and did real well, and I said, you're real, you should come out. So I did, so I've been here ever since. Well, love it. Yeah, and it's funny, too, when you speak to some of the younger guys coming up, who's your influence? Mark Chestnut, right. Alan Jackson, Garth Brooks, you know, they're naming all the I'm waiting for somebody to name you. Yeah. I can make a <laughs> But all these guys he's, in the 90s, they're a very obscure kid in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, man. 
So what have you got on the agenda immediately? You, the Joe Bonamassa? Yeah, coming up in January. Yeah, right now. I'm going to go back to Europe uh, or UK for the yeah. end of uh, I'm Sorry My Soldiers. We've got some shows on the Bluebird. Um, I do the same for the Annapolis coming up fairly soon. And then I'm writing like crazy. I have a new artist that I'm working with. Uh, her name is Ariel. Mm -hmm. She's an awesome artist. Um, who else have I been writing with? Uh, who would be your dream co-writer? Oh, that is Paul McCartney. Oh, really? Yeah, right. Well, the best. Does he? We'll, we'll make a call. Right. <laughs> well, it's just unyet. Just uh, I remember you know, talking about songwriting. McCartney, uh, Springsteen was quoted. They're silly love songs. Right. And he said, when I was young, I didn't get that. He does now. When I got older, I, I yeah. get it. Yeah. Get it big time. All that, all that wings music too. Yeah. You know, it's like, not only the Beatles work, and that's why he's the best ever. Not only Beatles work, because Jim and John Lennon were brilliant, and my son's name Lennon, by the way. So, but it's all that wings work he did. It's just, you know, you know baby on wings. And when you go see him live, you go, oh, this guy can turn out all that stuff. You know, so. And on the run, he's still brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You know, someone's knocking at my door. Yeah. Yeah, as a songwriter, I've, I've analyzed it and looked at do, it every Do you really do that? Do you pick out favorite songwriters and analyze their work? Well, I learned, you learn the song, yeah. so that just becomes part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And all the songs you learn. So by the time I was, when I was living in Sacramento, when I was, when I was a kid, I was in high school, I knew I wanted to do this. So. My plan was to learn as many songs as I could, so when I was 18, I started going to college and started going out to play, because you couldn't play in clubs. At least there was a bunch of dinner houses in there. So that's how I learned what I did. But I knew about 200 songs. So when I was 18, I could play you know, everything, all the stuff that come from James Taylor, to Simon Garfunkel, anything on a piece of your tongue. So I could sing all night, and then I'd start working on my, uh, my original songs. So. Yeah, it's funny, you talk to a lot of you know, people that come to Nashville and end up working at the, the hockey talks or the lower bra and they go, oh, I'm doing covers. That's going to make you better because how can you not become better at your craft when you're just taking in all these great songs? Yeah, they're all become almost core chant. And learning how to make them your own and say, yeah, I can do that, but with a bit of a twist. Uh, all the greats, and I, I was just reading see on an article this morning, it was on the, on the internet, it was the Beatles, the songs they'd nicked over the years. And it played this piano riff that was uh, that was uh, Lady Madonna. You know, it was an older 50s record. Everybody does it, yeah. and, and you should do it. It needs to be part of it. Bob Dylan had a great speech what, about a year ago talking about why he wrote what he did, because he just soaked up a ton of music. And then so that's what came out of him. And he said, I listened to all this Woody Guthrie stuff on it all over and over, played it all, learned it all, and all this, and that kind of just came back out through him. So, yeah, that's a, and I found my Texas friends, I always ask them, there's a lot of great Texas friends. And I'm like, well, how, why? It's because they, you know, they grew up playing the honky tonk, but they had to learn it. So you're right. So that makes you a better. You've had some pretty spectacular influence. I think we're both of the same generation. Right. Great music coming out of that generation. And everything. I mean, I love everything. I love from the old pop, the Sinatra, and, uh, you know, Bing Crosby, Neck and Cole. That was music. See, when our house, when I was a kid, we lived on the brain. We didn't have a TV when I lived in Oregon. We were so far out there, there was no TV at that moment, but we had a record player. You didn't, didn't have Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to, yeah, 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 Right, yeah, like, we didn't have lights, we had to watch TV in the dark, so. Um, but anyway, we just played records all the time, so you got the, the tons and tons of records. And everybody had a record, because you couldn't afford them all, it was expensive, so. If you were as a kid, we used to have a record party, so I was telling you, son of a, yeah. Somebody had the doors, they had the Beatles, they had the Beatle records. You know, you know, a kid had one record, Randy Rose had the yeah. Zeppelin records. Yeah. The original file sharing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as you go, to spin records. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we were wrong. Thanks for your time today. Thanks. Thanks it's always great to hang out with you. Likewise. We'll be watching for more. Welcome to America. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you next time.